Okay, so I think we'll start away. We might be having a few more people enter as we start some introductions. Um, just as a starting introduction, I'm Christina Marriott. I'm the Chief Executive of the Royal Society for Public Health, and I'm here to welcome you to this, the third of our OSPH Sparks Debates webinars. Um, so far in the series, we've hosted Professor Chris Whitty um, discussing the relationship between the state and public health. And last week we hosted Maggie Ray, Richard Sluggett and Jonathan Pearson Stoddard discussing what good public health system looks like. In both of those webinars, we've had um, a really interesting conversation on the chat function. So if anybody wants to uh, make contact or make comment or ask questions, do please put it into the chat function. Today we're looking at what is public health and what are the drivers of good public health. And this is in the context, of course, of the last year when the term public health has been said probably more than at any other time in any at any point in history. Although, of course, in the, in the context of the pandemic, the protection aspects of public health have been uppermost in people's minds. Later, Joyce Attree, the Acting Director of Health and Wellbeing at Public Health Wales, will be discussing levers for public health at a national agency level. And Professor Derek Ward will be discussing the core domains of public health and what they look like at a local authority level. But first we have Dr Nigel Carter, OBE, speaking from his wide experience on the breadth of public health, its relationship to the wider workforce and other social drivers of health. Dr Carter has been a dentist for more than four decades and Chief Exec of the Oral Health Foundation since 1997. He has a keen interest in public health and in health promotion and has been chair of RSPH's council since September 2019. In 2012, he was honoured with an OBE for services to dentistry and dental health. And he is the current chairman of the Platform for Better Oral Health in Europe, which aims to improve oral health across Europe and to reduce health inequalities. I know he will give us a really interesting uh, starter today, thinking about the breadth of public health. So over to you, Dr. Carter. Thank you, Christina. And I'm delighted to join Christina in welcoming you all to uh, this event. Um, I'd like to take perhaps a not traditional view of a public health professional uh, to public health and what that means to people and the breadth of public health. And to a certain extent, this goes back into the origins and history of the Royal Society of Public Health. Royal Society of Public Health is a merger of very many organisations over the years. Uh, most recently, some 13 years ago, the merger of the Royal Institute for Public Health, which was largely a body of professional public health experts, public health doctors, uh, and the Royal Society for the Promotion of Health, which had a much broader base with 18 different membership categories respecting all aspects of oral health. But if we go back even further than that, the origins of both of those organizations back in the late 19th century was around sanitation, it was around pure water. Uh, many people listening, I'm sure, will be familiar with the story of uh, John Snow and the pump, and the pump handle, which in fact belonged to the Royal Society for the promotion of health for very many years. Uh, and that is really the start of epidemiology as we know it. But we have the sanitation aspect uh, attached onto that. So what were the public health drivers in those areas? It wasn't actually the doctors treating the disease, it was the sanitation system. And much of the early work around uh, public health related to sanitation, it related to clear water, it related to sewage disposal. And of course, when we look on a broader global basis, that issue of pure water is still of key importance in a number of developing countries. Now, over the years, uh, RSPH and its precursor organisations as they've merged together have concentrated very much on all aspects of things which uh, affect public health. And in the last 
a decade or so, we have done a lot of work around uh, the wider workforce in public health, which is not necessarily the traditional people as professionals that we think of, uh, but can involve a broad range uh, of people. And very much looking at uh, the social determinants approach of upstream, midstream and downstream, which I'm sure many people are familiar with. At its highest level, then one of the key drivers which can affect public health is public policy. So the politicians, the ministers, the government officials, the civil servants, who can influence our public health by introducing policies uh, such as no smoking uh, or in public places or in the area that I'm associated with, sugar taxation, obviously clearly um, very influential in terms of dental decay as well as obesity and diabetes. Now those are policies at the highest level which have the ability to affect all our lives and the public's health. We then start to move down into the midstream area uh, where we're looking at delivering uh, policy on a more local level within communities. And this might be things such as organizing mental health programs, it might be smoking cessation programs, um, it might be looking at drug addiction at the community level. And then we're down to the downstream level where we've got individual practitioners working with individual members of the public. But none of these areas can actually work in isolation. We really have to look at the whole of this as a continuum. And at each of those points, there are various aspects where the wider workforce who wouldn't in any way think of themselves as public health professionals actually get involved in delivering messages which benefit uh, the public health. RSPH has also over the years been very active in the field of qualifications across the whole area of public health underpinning many of the elements which are quite important uh, in that delivery and improvement of the, of the public's health. And this has been from a core of food safety qualifications through to uh, things in the, the building sector like asbestos, um, through to pest control, all of which don't at first sight necessarily have a public health aspect, which are key in underpinning those public health things. The wider workforce work that uh, RSPH has been doing over a, a number of years now has encompassed things like working with the emergency services, fire services. They're ideally placed to be delivering public health campaigns out in the community from the work that they do. The fire service in particular in various parts of the country is doing some great work using their dying time when they're not fighting fires to actually look at improving public health by improving uh, things like fire safety, visiting people in their homes uh, and so on. So going back to the Royal Society for the Promotion of Health, one of our precursor organizations, we had something like 18 different membership categories. And all of these have something to do with delivering better health for the public. And that's from the traditional public health medical experts through environmental health experts, but going back to things like architects and the built environment, the built environment that we live in is key to uh, the public health that people experience. And I think we only have to look at what we see in terms of some of the now commonly called sink estates that were built in the, in the 60s, at the public health and social problems that they have led to by not properly considering the environment in which they were built, the way that they were built and the impact on people. So social determinants come in very much there into that uh, environment. And we can then go across into areas 
on the uh, high street where planning authorities and planning committees are very involved in the allocation of premises. We see, and the RSPH has done a lot of work over the last few years in terms of healthy high streets or rather unhealthy high streets as very many of them are, where we see every vacant shop that comes up being allocated a license to be a takeaway uh, and provide unhealthy food generally in poorer communities where this is even more uh, of an issue. So this sort of work, it, it creates the breadth. And as we started to look at the healthy high street work, then you look at areas like the betting shop, bad in terms of gambling, but perhaps a social area and a value in other ways. And how do we actually analyze uh, some of these um, community facilities. Is the pub good or bad? It's a social meeting place, which is good for people, helps their mental health, but equally it's selling alcohol, which is not good for our health. So these are very complex issues. The hairdresser can perhaps be a source of good public health information in terms of the conversations that they're having with their clients. So it's very important, I think, that we don't focus ourselves, and we've been very focused over the period of the pandemic, and to traditional public health. But we look at how this vast workforce out there can actually operate to improve the public's health. One of the other areas that RSPH has been heavily involved in in the last few years is the healthy living pharmacy. And clearly based in the community, these community workers in common with some of the others that uh, I've mentioned have a key role to play in improving the public's oral health and trying to help reduce the social inequalities which exist uh, across the board. Now I see I'm ending the uh, my allocated 10 minutes so I will draw to a can close and uh, pass on now to the professionals but I just wanted to set the piece here by really having a look at this broad aspect and how so many people can work to improve the public's oral health. Fantastic thank you Nigel and I and I love the fact we've started with that thought about how broad public health is how broad it is across systems, across different workforces, across um, across the place, actually, across every place we live, there are multiple places where public health can take place. We're going to move to Joyce Atri, who is the Acting Director of Health and Wellbeing in Public Health Wales. And like everybody else in public health over the last year, she has contributed rather largely to the public health response to COVID-19. She joined Public Health Wales in, in September 2017 and has made major contributions to improving collaborative working for public health and to chronic disease prevention. Previously, she was a director of public health in the West Midlands. She held public health roles in Sandwell and South Birmingham PCTs. And her early career was really interesting as a researcher and then as a public health analyst, working on equality of access to services and how that could be achieved in some of the more deprived areas of East London. She will be talking today about what the national drivers for good public health can look like. Over to you. Thank you. And, and I should say that I'm only interim uh, Director of Health and Wellbeing until the end of this week. And next week I'll be starting as Director of Public Health for Peterborough and Cambridgeshire. So just to put it in context. Um, I'm going to start by talking a bit about the setup in Wales because it is uh, quite unique and quite different from um, some of the other nations. Um, public Health is a, a national public health organisation and it's set up as an NHS trust, unlike uh, Public Health England. It's uh, almost exclusively the employer of uh, public health specialist staff in Wales. So directors of public health are employed by health boards, but their teams, the local public health teams, are employed by Public Health Wales and sits within my directorate in the organisation. Uh, in Wales, there are seven health boards and uh, 22 local authorities. Local authorities currently don't have any specialist public health uh, staff sitting within them. And health boards have, um, there's no purchase of provider split in Wales. So um, they're directly provided services and they provide 
primary, community and secondary services. So in effect, they're integrated health uh, organisations. Um, I couldn't really talk about Wales without talking about the policy and legislative context. And I think that's one of our key levers actually in Wales. Um, and in particular, I would single out the, the Future Generations Act, which I think is unique to Wales. I've not come across anything else uh, that's remotely similar. It's got cross-party agreement and uh, it aims to force uh, public sector bodies to consider the impact of the policies that they make today and the actions they take today on future generations. And it has sustainability um, and equality and prevention at the heart of it. And, and that's a lever that we, we pull on, on many occasions to remind our partners of their obligations uh, with regards to that. Health boards also have uh, statutory functions uh, around uh, population health. And I think that's another lever for us to use to um, support health boards to meet the needs of the entire population that they serve, not just those that pass through their doors. Um, moving back again to the role of Public Health Wales, um, Public Health Wales covers all three domains of health, uh, of public health, so health improvement, health protection, and uh, healthcare public health, underpinned by health intelligence. Uh, the organisation also offers uh, microbiology services and screening. Um, as well as health protection services in, in support of health boards. And we provide the intelligence, knowledge and evidence-based um, services that are required to support uh, local public health teams to do their jobs effectively. And uh, as you've alluded to already, Public Health Wales have taken a key leadership role uh, in the response to the pandemic, ranging from providing specialist uh, public health advice to Welsh Government, uh, to developing testing capability and capacity, contact tracing, uh, the response to COVID in care homes, and so on. So if I move back to my directorate in particular, um, I've got 300 staff sitting in my directorate. So uh, that includes the local public health teams and I have a budget of around 28 million. Um, so that's um, a relatively small budget. I'm sure many directors of public health have uh, budgets about that size or maybe even bigger, um, but that budget is to cover uh, public health services for the entirety of Wales. Um, we don't, I don't commission, uh, our local public health teams don't commission health visiting, school nursing uh, and sexual health services, alcohol treatment services, et cetera. So, um, you know, that budget could be taken off, uh, considered to be, you know, the budget could be considered to be re reduced by that amount, but actually the budget is almost entirely used for, uh, to pay for staff. So I have very little additional budget and the directors of uh, public health have very little uh, additional budget for uh, public health interventions. Um, my directorate consists of um, three key areas. I have a health improvement division that works on um, broadly the uh, behavioral risk factors. So smoking cessation, tobacco control more broadly reducing alcohol related harms, uh, obesity, as well as early years uh, and mental well-being. I have a primary care directorate uh, that um, supports health boards in uh, developing new models of primary care to ensure there's greater sustainability of primary care and that primary care can meet its growing demands. Um, and they are also supporting health boards with um, cluster development. They're kind of the equivalent of CCGs, as well as uh, trying to improve and embed primary care prevention into cluster plans. Um, I think a, a key lever that uh, we have as a National Public Health Institute is our proximity to Welsh Government. Uh, and to advise, support, 
um, Welsh Government in uh, legislation, development and policy development. That's another really strong lever that we have as a national organisation. And if I can give you one example to illustrate that, that's our Healthy Weight, uh, Healthy Wales uh, strategy that we've worked really closely uh, with Welsh Government to develop. We've provided uh, intelligence, we've provided uh, evidence synthesis, uh, as well as uh, a public engagement uh, and the views of our partner agencies uh, in actively shaping um, that policy with uh, Welsh Government. We further contributed to the development of that strategy by carrying out a, an obesity review across Wales and we'll continue to support Welsh Government in the implementation of that strategy, for example, through uh, the development of media campaigns. Um, so if I um, talk a little bit more about my role in particular, uh, I've talked about the limitation of uh, resources uh, in Wales and um, I think further observations have been made that um, things are done kind of seven times in Wales because we've got this health board uh, 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 arrangement with the DPHs being employed by health boards there's been very little direction um, given uh, in terms, of, we don't have mandated services, for example, in Wales. So uh, it's really been up to the local directors of public health to, to develop their own strategies. And that coupled with uh, lack of resources has meant that it's been really difficult to demonstrate uh, measurable population health improvements at a national level because uh, we're doing things in seven different ways. Um, we're using different insights and, uh, and intelligence. And we've got very little money to spend on any interventions. Um, so I think a key role of mine in the time that I've been here has been to A, try and uh, get more money into the system for prevention and to galvanize the system towards agreed evidence-based interventions that we can all push together on in order to achieve that um, measurable population health impact. So um, I've worked uh, with partners, with health boards, with directors of public health and local government, as well as uh, third sector bodies and other partners to uh, gain agreement to a number of evidence-based uh, interventions, which we've successfully done. We've then used that to present to Welsh government who have agreed to an additional 7.2 million funding across uh, the nation for prevention. Uh, so we've, we've got the additional funding and we've also got the agreement to, to work on these evidence-based uh, interventions in concert. And we're further, further developing that through uh, the development of a multi-agency partnership that we've called Building a Healthier Wales. And the aim of that is to attract even more funding for prevention, but perhaps more crucially, to turn the ship around, to move uh, the spend in public sector, so that's both in the health service and um, local government, away from uh, acute spend towards prevention. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so interesting that one, isn't it? The, the struggle we have to reallocate budget from acute to prevention, the struggle we always have to, to make the spend happen where it needs to happen. And I think also you're really interesting there around the context of the Future Generation Act, because it is so important in Wales, but also the challenges of, of how that translates when you're working through seven health boards. There's a, there's a tension there of, of national ambition and a fantastic uh, framework and actually how it gets delivered at the local level. And I'm sure that will come back in questions. So thank you so much for that. I will pass over to Derek to talk about it from the other perspective, I guess, of, of that tension between national and local, although Derek has uh, expertise and experience both sides of that divide. So Derek has been the Director of Public Health in Lincolnshire since February 2018. And he is also the Visiting Professor of Public Health at the University of Lincoln Medical School. He has been on the Council of RSPH since November 2017. Between 2015 and 18, he led the Health and Social Care Research Centre at the University of Derby and provided professional 
uh, public health advice and support to the four CCG groups across Derbyshire. So that balance of academic and practice seems, seems to run throughout Derek's career. Prior to taking up that joint role, he was the director of public health for Derby City for five years, but he's also got significant experience at a national and regional policy work, having been both a consultant in public health, but also a senior civil servant in the Department of Health. He's a fellow of the Faculty of Public Health, and he is also the East Midlands Clinical Public Health Research Lead for the NIHR, the National Institute for Health, for health Research. Um, I'm really pleased Derek can join us. We, we all know the, the challenge that people working in public health have had over the last year, so uh, both, for, both for Joyce and Derek, I'm really pleased you could join us. Derek will be thinking about the three core domains of public health and what they look like from a DPH perspective. Over to you, Derek. Thanks, Christina. Um, just just before I jump into the three core domains, I just to pick up on something that Nigel said at the beginning, which is uh, I absolutely agree with him. Um, the the wider workforce in public health will do far more to improve the health and well-being of the people of the, the country than uh, me or my uh, peers as directors of public health across the country will ever do. So um, we we really can't lose that. Having said that, I'm going to focus specifically on my experience and, and, and what local authority, uh, the local authority role is. Um, I'm also going to pick up a little bit on what uh, Jyoti said in terms of the, the money bit. Um, and I'll try and provide two bits to this because I think it's important context. So um, overall, over the past uh, year or so, the Department of Health, uh, Department of Health and Social Care as it is, budget uh, was £212 billion in 2021. £212 billion. Pounds. A huge amount of money. Um, now, that was severely inflated for, for COVID. So if we take that COVID budget, what you get to is about £150 billion pounds is the recurrent funding that the Department of Health and Social Care gets um, to deliver its vast um, areas of work. And certainly when I worked for the Department of Health, as it was then, there were three broad areas. One uh, is the NHS, second is social care, and the third, and to some extent the little one, is public health. And I think those three domains are reflected in how the money is spent. So of that um, 150 billion, if we take out the COVID money, uh, about 87% of it goes to NHS England. And that, in my view, is to deal with sickness. Very, very small proportion of that actually deals with health. Um, so whilst we have, in my view, again, and I think this is supported by lots of evidence reviews, one of the best um, health and sickness services in the world, it is predominantly focused on sickness. It is dealing with people once they've already got uh, disease. Um, and we spend 87% of our budget that we give to dealing with that sickness component. Um, th there's obviously social care as well. And then we get to public health and, and the, the budget that goes to Public Health England, and I, I noticed in the questions is a question about what will be the future model, but let's just talk about where we are now. Budget that goes to Public Health England or went in 2021 was 4.2 billion, which is about 2.8% of that total DHSC budget. So less than 3% on direct public health. And of that, about 2.2% of the total budget, so that's 3.3 billion uh, goes down to local authorities in, in, uh, in England. So I think that the argument is that um, if you are looking uh, to stop people getting sick in the first place or to improve their, um, to, if they've already got a condition, to stop them getting worse, there isn't absolutely an argument to say that we don't spend enough money on keeping people fit and healthy. Uh, it was Benjamin Franklin in 1736 who said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Whenever I say that, everybody nods sagely, yes, that's true. And then I say, and you do know we spend about 2% of the budget on prevention and 98% on cure. And then they go, oh, right, yeah. Uh, and that sort of proportion hasn't changed in the 20 odd years I've been doing this job. So there is something there about the money. Having said all that, um, in, in my patch, we get about 1.2, 1.3 billion pounds into Lincolnshire uh, for three quarters of a million people. It's a huge amount of money. 
So I think the argument to say that um, we don't get enough money is wrong. I think what we need to do is be really, really clear about decisions. And that if I come forwards with an argument as to why we should spend money in an area, it's not that we haven't got the money, it's just that we haven't made the decision to spend it where I think we should. And I think that's a really important context for us as public health practitioners. It's one of the key roles that certainly I think directors of public health have, is to make those debates, is to shift, as, as uh, Jaffe was saying, that 87%. That so it's not just firefighting, it's actually helping to protect the public's health. How do we do that? In the three core domains of public health and local authorities, um, the three core domains are health improvement, health protection and healthcare services, um, or at least that's how I like to describe it. The health improvement bit um, is, is pretty straightforward. It's, um, it's the bit that I point my finger at you and say, don't do that, that's naughty, you shouldn't do that, except we have to change that language clearly and we have to make it a positive message. So it is the, the things that we do around healthy weight. How do we help the people of the country maintain a healthy weight? Because of all the benefits that one accrues by maintaining a healthy weight. Um, how do we help people who are smokers who want to quit to stop smoking? That's another key question. Um, and it's one that we spend a, a, a big chunk of money on. Um, and generally we've done a good job, but we have pockets of real challenge with our smokers. And that drives the wider um, focus within health improvement or um, um, health promotion, as the new uh, Office for Health Promotion will be called, uh, that's under the Chief Medical Officer, uh, around inequalities. Because we do know, and every pandemic from the Black Death onwards has demonstrated that inequality drives um, that, that or, or inequality becomes even more obvious within a pandemic scenario, and we're seeing that with COVID. So health improvement is very much about how do we keep people fit and healthy. Um, it's very specific in terms of physical activity, diet and nutrition, stop smoking services, sexual health services, but it's also very broad about how do we tackle health inequalities, how do we make sure that education services are set up to, to help um, children achieve the most that they can. Second domain, uh, and the one that probably everybody is very aware of now, is, uh, is health protection. Um, and health protection really is around infectious disease control, um, dealing with chemical and poison outbreaks, radiation, um, emergency response, environmental hazards in, in my patch in Lincolnshire. We, we're very flat, we've got a lot of water around us, and we're always dealing with flooding. And there is a key uh, challenge there from a public health perspective about how we help people deal with the environment within which they live. Um, the history of public health is, is really uh, around clean air and clean water. Um, some would argue we started in the sewers and we may end back up in the sewers. Certainly, we are monitoring wastewater at the moment for COVID levels. So clean air, clean water and the environment is a core perspective around health protection, as is dealing with outbreaks of disease. We talk about uh, COVID at the moment, of course, and a huge amount of work that's going on in COVID. Um, we deal with outbreaks of tuberculosis still, and I don't think that will ever stop. Um, we deal with mumps, measles, rubella in student populations, and obviously we work very closely in England at least. I know that the model's different in Wales, um, as we've just heard, but in England we work very closely with Public Health England and um, our NHS colleagues around vaccination and immunisation to make sure that we protect people from those risks. So health improvement, health protection, uh, I spend a lot of my day job doing. The third area, and the area that people don't see, it's not as obvious, but it's probably the most important, and it's, it's where I'll wrap up and come back to the money bit, is around health care. How do we know that the, in my patch, the 1.2, 1.3 billion that the NHS is spending is getting the best outcome for people? Um, an individual medical or, or, or nursing practitioner sitting in front of a, of a patient, their primary job is to get the best outcome from that patient. The key difference to public health practices, my job is to get the best outcome for the population. So I have to think of the three quarters of a million people in Lincolnshire all the time. And what that means sometimes is that an individual doesn't get the best outcome because that best outcome 
could spend could cost three million pounds for the next three months for one person and that's a real challenge and conundrum and a big part of my job is to work with the nhs to understand where we spend money will always have an opportunity cost because if we spend money here it means we can't spend money here and so just to try and wrap up my, my little bit of this that brings me full circle to that budget question um, we spend as a system as a country um, a huge amount of money in my patch alone so as a country 150 billion in lincolnshire 1.2 1.3 billion so whenever we don't do something or whenever somebody says um we haven't got enough money i don't think that's the case i think we just haven't made the argument properly i'll pause there and uh, pass on thank you derek really interesting and i think alongside your comments around budget, I think I might add something around the health and care bill and, and how concentrated on the NHS that was with a slight, oh, and we might think about social care, we might think about public health at a later point. And there seems to be a, a real kind of parallel there of, of both attention and budget. Um, I also heard a really interesting comment earlier this week around healthcare saying that with flu season, you know you ask any nurse working in a general practice how their flu season's going and they will tell you how fantastically they've reached their whole population because of course they've worked every hour god has sent in order to get flu vaccinations into arms but the bit they miss and that public health always has to bring in is the who didn't come who wasn't there you might have been really busy but actually it was only x percent of the population and and as ever on a social gradient so we've had a whole flood of really interesting questions both coming in before the webinar started also through the webinar so I'm going to try and get through as many of these as we can in the next 15 or so minutes um, a couple of specific ones first so Nigel if I can come to you first there's been some questions around the social gradient and oral health so people commenting on how oral health links to overall health and therefore um, how important it is to, to get access to good quality health care and, and dentistry um, but also around the social gradient and how that affects dental hygiene. Um, do you want to comment on the social gradient and dental hygiene and what can be done within dentistry and with public health to, uh, to tackle that? Yeah, I mean, ab absolutely. As in common with many of the chronic diseases, then poor oral health is uh, closely related to social gradient. Um, if we look at the areas where oral health is worse, where we're having very high experience of general anaesthetics to take out uh, teeth in children and the, the shocking fact, I mean, we, we often forget because it's not life threatening that dental decay is the most common non-communicable disease worldwide. It does relate to poverty and disadvantage. And let's face it, if you are living on the poverty line, then actually buying a toothbrush and toothpaste is maybe not top of your list of priorities. So that's partly where it starts. Diets are going to be poorer. They're going to be higher in uh, sugary foods, which are going to lead to decay. Uh, so there's a, there's a whole raft of issues there. Uh, and when we look at the country as a whole, as areas um, where oral health is worse, up in the uh, northwest, in areas of um, Scotland, now, uh, sorry, in areas of Yorkshire. Now, Scotland in particular used to have particularly bad oral health. And this shows the value of a good public health intervention across the piece, because one exemplar project, and it's been taken on by, as an exemplar um, by the European Union, is the Child Smile programme in Scotland, where they recognise their poor oral health. They put a programme in place to actually work with families in the home as part of the postnatal health visitor care. Uh, through into supervised toothbrushing in schools and they've really started to turn their childhood decay around uh, but this again is very much looking at it as a public health um, intervention so yeah uh, you know huge social gradient issues there 
uh, and something that we need to work on through a public health approach. It's it's great to see, and particularly from a Conservative government, that we now, for the first time, appear to have backing uh, for water fluoridation from government uh, on a national level. And that is the single public health measure and very much relates to what I was talking about upstream, downstream. Government acting there can totally turn around the oral health of the country. And, and just to pick up on your comment there about health visitors, what a fantastic public health workforce they are in terms of that targeting into specific communities, specific roads, their knowledge of local communities. And, and that workforce, I think, has, has at times been undervalued in public health in, in terms of their very specific reach into communities. And hugely underfunded. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, to, uh, a question for both Derek and Jyoti on the health protection aspects of, of your, probably of your very recent career. So for both of you, in terms of disease control, what are some of the most challenging decisions you've made? And I'm sure both of you will have faced some, some quite substantial challenges over the next year and some very difficult uh, judgments calls. Who wants to come in first? I'll, I'll have a go at that, but, but I just wanted to also comment on the, um, the oral health question before. I, my, my last job was Director of Public Health in Samwell, which was a, a pretty uniformly deprived area, um, but we had fluoridated water and it made a huge difference to the decayed missing and filled teeth in, in our young children. Um, and uh, I, I absolutely agree with Nigel, it's great to see uh, this government endorse uh, fluoridation. Uh, on to the trickier question. <laughs> um, I, I led on uh, care homes in, in the height of the pandemic when, when, um, when COVID was uh, really uh, circulating quite heavily in, in care homes. And uh, I have to say it was uh, probably the hardest uh, period in my entire career. Um, I'm sure it, you know, many of my colleagues will have had very similar experiences working every waking hour for about a period of two months, um, feeling that you just couldn't get on top of, of the situation or the workload or relationships with partners, receiving criticism from every direction, um, you know, from care homes, from the Welsh government, from, um, from client, you know, people in care homes, their families. Um, it was a, a thankless uh, task. And yes, indeed, some difficult decisions had to be made because I had limited resources available to me. Um, you know, there were other things going on, the general contact tracing, testing capacity, et cetera, et cetera, happening around us. Um, and I suppose, I mean, I don't know whether it's a decision that was difficult to make, but a decision we ended up making was that we, we got into territory we shouldn't uh, necessarily have got into. So uh, because our health boards weren't ready to um, arrange testing or provide results, they just weren't geared up for it. We ended up um, taking on some of that responsibility, which actually uh, ended up being another thankless task because it just resulted in more complaints <laughs> for us. So, uh, you know, that's one example. I could pick others, but they might get me into even hotter water. So I'll stop there. <laughs> Leave you before it gets too hot. Derek, any from, from your perspective? Uh, probably quite similar um, around the, uh, the work that we did with our NHS partners as we were um, discharging people um, and we were in a lucky position really I think in, in, in my patch in that we agreed quite early on that we would not discharge to um, two care homes with a COVID unknown status um, and that uh, that was difficult at some points because clearly the hospital has, has to get the flow through um, and we had to put various different models in place where we had step down beds where we could cohort for people where we were still waiting results back. Um, and I think, I think my perspective, I would say that the, the, the speed and the accuracy of our testing regime is one of the positives that's come out of COVID. Um, the speed and accuracy of our tracing uh, element is not so much 
would be my diplomatic way of saying it. So I think we quite quickly got the testing program up and running. That was great, um, and and that meant that we could we could make sure we weren't bringing people back where we didn't know whether they were COVID positive or negative into what were very high risk settings. But a lot of that was down to the relationships and and us as a as a, um, a local authority supported my politicians me holding a very very strong line with the nhs uh, much to the disgust of certain nhs england people um but because we had the po political support to do that we, we were able to do that there, there have certainly been some real challenges uh, right across in, in the last year i know nigel just wanted to come back around sandwell because he has some some um i i hadn't realized we have two speakers who have sandwell um expertise and experience here I, I just wanted to pick up on what josh was saying on uh samwell because it was my first practice uh back in the area before samwell was fluoridated and i think out of 92 93 uh health authorities at that time it was down in the bottom 10 and it was fluoridated in 87, one of the last areas in the country to be fluoridated, and within five years was in the top 10. And that just demonstrates this huge value in oral health of fluoridation as an issue and how those inequalities in what was a very poor borough uh, could be reduced so dramatically by a single measure. A great example of, of how national intervention and local intervention can really drive differences in population health. Um, we have a series of questions around looking forward. So I'm going to start with what do we think is the biggest crisis or problem or threat to the public health that will significantly affect um, the public's health in the next 10 years if action isn't taken now? So what's the bit that we think is coming down the line that we should be taking action on now? any Derek? Um, I think we're already there and it, I think it's um, maintaining a healthy weight is the biggest priority for us. It's not to say that um, helping people to quit smoking if they're smokers isn't a priority. It is, of course it is, and it's the single biggest driver of health inequalities. But I think where we are now, we're at least a tipping point. If not, we've tipped over so that healthy weight is absolutely vital if we want to... Um, we want to avoid all of the challenges that we'll see um, in the NHS that we know will come. Um, I'm going back to the point about uh, an answer prevention is worth a pound of cure. It, it's even more, more relevant when we talk about healthy weight, isn't it? Um, so we, we need to help people uh, to lose the answers now so that we don't spend the pounds in the future um, through, through, a, through a sickness service. And that's, that's a key challenge for us. I'll come back to that one if that's okay, Derek, thinking about underserved groups and social gradient and how we can assure that it's the entire population. Jyoti, I think you wanted to come in. Yeah, I did. I, I, I thought um, that Derek was going to say what I was going to say, but he didn't. Um, so yes, I agree. I think it's already here, um, but I think it's uh, the threat to our economy. Um, it's uh, the impending recession that's uh, probably about to hit us and you know if you go down to your local high street you'll probably start to see it already I know I have in in mine um, and that then obviously uh, impacts on uh, those that are at the bottom of us you know the poorer people it has the potential to widen inequalities and that will impact on us. And again, I think we're starting to see it already. We're starting to see the impact on uh, mental well-being, demand for mental ill health uh, services, um, and that will continue to impact on behavioral risk factors and uh, ultimately deaths. So uh, I think it will have much longer impact than any one particular behavioral risk factor and ha it'll have impact on multiple risk factors. And again, we'll return to what can we do about this in, in the coming years. Nigel, anything from you in terms of biggest risk factor that we, we're we not engaging with and should be? I, th I think the the recessionary factor is, is really going to be the real danger. Uh, I think we've had missed opportunities. I was very pleased to hear what Derek was saying about the 
uh, what I think should have, we missed an opportunity with reorganisation of the health service to actually call the NHS what it is, the National Illness Service, because you don't actually want to be part of the National Illness Service. But the NHS, the National Health Service, has this warm feeling about it, that it's there to protect us and it's for our health. It's not, it's for treating illness and really you don't want to be part of that. So let's try and shift um, that balance of funding away from treatment towards preventing disease in the first place. And that's going to be really challenging with the financial times that we have ahead, I think. So I'm going to ask a last question to all of you, and, and I'm going to allow you lots of flexibility as to which question you want to answer in this one. I'm going to jumble up a few questions because we've got a, a real variety of questions in here. What's our biggest opportunity looking forward and what can we achieve in the next 10 years? What should the public health look like in 10 or 20 years time? In particular, what interventions are there to tackle that social gradient, those health inequalities we've been talking about? If there was, if you could wave a magic wand and you've got one minute to tell us about it, what does that magic wand look like? Derek? I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with, it. well, it's going to be a bit of a polemic, um, considering the the audience, I'm sure I'm going to get shut down, but um, I, I don't disagree that uh, a recession for the, the economy is absolutely fundamental to public health outcomes. Of course it is, we, we, you know, we're all trained in that, we know that um, in, our, in our blood. However, for me, personally, my practice is about, so what can I do? What can I do on a day-to-day -day basis, which is why I focused my answer around healthy weight. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm a natural optimist, despite coming through a pandemic that's a one in 100, hopefully one in 100 year uh, situation, in that we are now um, more visible than we were ever. Uh, I, and, and to some extent, that's a good thing. But to a large extent, public health really benefits when we are the voice behind the throne, when we are whispering in people's ears when we are the angel on people's shoulders rather than the devil or at least to counterbalance the devil and i think we've got a real opportunity to to go to that space to help people uh, reflect on what the you know the challenges of covid but also so some people and absolutely this is an inequality argument some people have had more physical activity some people have um, had more free time. Some people have developed new skills and, and ambitions because of COVID uh, and, and being stuck at home or, or being in different scenarios. We need to build on that. We need to focus on positives rather than focus on negatives. And I think that's going to be the challenge over the next, uh, the next couple of years. Thank you. Nigel? I, th I think it's if, if we're to use the political buzz phrase, it's it's about leveling up um, and devolution of responsibility with experiments like Devo Mank, perhaps greater responsibility for health in local areas. Uh, and public health in local areas, looking at the social determinants uh, in those areas is perhaps the way forward. I mean, even within the pandemic now, we're seeing these pockets of resistance to figures of COVID dropping based around inequalities, based around uh, racial differences. And I think those are the areas that we have to really address and work forward. And it's also about getting people to take responsibility we haven't heard so much about the nanny state recently, but if we are reliant or feel that we're reliant on, well, the NHS is always there for us, it's going to put us right, it's going to treat us if something goes wrong. We need to change the mindset across populations as a whole that their health and well-being lies in their own hands. So it is around the things like uh, Derek is talking about in terms of exercise, in terms of diet, it's not let's eat until we burst, become obese, because we know the health service is going to look after our heart attack. It's actually having that personal responsibility. And I think it's that mind shift that we really need to see to improve health as a whole. 
And final comments to you, Jyoti. Thank you. Um, I think we have some unique opportunities. I think for the first time, we can all see that global poverty is important to us. Uh, it's important that we get the world vaccinated, not just this country. If we're going to return to any kind of normality, I think COVID has absolutely shone a spotlight on inequalities and there's a moment to, to seize around that. And I want to fundamentally disagree with Derek. <laughs> I think directors of public health in local government are uniquely placed to do something about the wider determinants of health. Uh, and one example might be working with our colleagues to ensure that there's a safety net around those who are at the margins of society that they, uh, people don't take up their benefits. For example, people don't take up free school meals. Let's support our colleagues, work with our colleagues to maximize those types of opportunities to minimize the harm to those on the margins. Thank you. Thank you, Han, and I will enjoy an offline conversation of a disagreement there at some point. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna pick up two practical questions that have come in. Um, there's one about becoming a fellow of RSPH. I'm gonna direct you to the membership section of our website where it lays out the difference between a fellow and a member and an associate. And it also gives you links, telephone and email links to our membership team who can help you with an application or answer any of your questions. I wanted to let members know that this webinar um, is available for CPD points. So, so if you need continuous professional development points, if you go to the members section of the website, you can find the details out there. This website will be on the webinar, so if you want to refer back to it or catch up with it or catch up with other webinars in the series, um, it will be on the, our website. Professor Witter's webinar is also is currently on the public section of the website. Last week's is currently in the members section, but it will hit the public section in a couple of weeks time. Um, I've seen something in the chat talking about a future webinar on inequalities. That is most certainly in, in that planning. Um, if you've ticked to receive information from us, we'll let you know about future webinars as they come out. Our next one in this series is on the 30th of June and it's thinking about co-production and public voice in public health. Um, in my last, two, my last 30 seconds, can I just thank all of our speakers for just brilliant contributions. There's been some really nice comments in, in the chat, really interesting conversation I found in the last hour. And can I thank everybody who's attended for making this such an interesting hour. Thank you and see you at a future one.